In this video, we're going to be talking about species accumulation curves. Species accumulation curves are pretty important things for the community ecologist. They tell us a lot about how well we've been able to sample the community that we're studying, and they can also tell us things about how different communities work and about the species density and the species richness in different ecological communities. So how do we build a species accumulation curve? Well, let's think about the case where we've got different levels of effort in our sampling of the species in the community. We can have a low effort and we can have a high effort. The low effort might be we spend a single night trapping, the high effort might be we spend six months trapping whatever species we're interested in and then we look at our species richness. If we only put a small effort into sampling from our community we're only going to find a small number of the species that are actually present in that community. So we might find just a few species with a single night of sampling. If we add in an extra night of sampling, we're going to find some more species, but also we're going to find some of the species that we've already found. So we're not going to find double the number of species for double the number of effort. We will maybe find slightly less than double the number. And then if we increase our sampling effort even more, we're going to get more and more diminishing returns as the amount of effort we put in goes on. So the number of new species that we find with each sampling effort, with each, nights of sam with each night of sampling or each day of sampling or each extra trap that we add is going to decrease as the amount of effort we've already put in goes up. And you can see that the number of new species that we find with each added piece of effort for our sampling is declining until we reach a point where we don't find any more species at all. And at this point where we're not finding any more species at all, despite increasing the amount of sampling effort we're putting in, we can think that we've found all of the species that are present in that community. And that's quite an important thing, knowing that you've found all of the species that are present in the community. And also knowing that you haven't found all the species that are present in the community is pretty important too. So once we've drawn a graph like this, we can put a line through these data points. And that line is our species accumulation curve. And you can see this has the very typical shape of a species accumulation curve. It starts off with a reasonably steep slope. As you increase the amount of effort you put in, you get lots more species. Then you reach a point where the amount of effort you put in doesn't give you much of a return in terms of numbers of new species. And then finally, you reach a point where the whole thing is saturated and you can put in more effort, but you don't get more species by doing so. Here are some examples of real species accumulation curves. These are from trees sampled in old growth and second growth forest in Costa Rica. And the people who did the survey identified every tree with a stem more than one centimeter diameter breast height in 100 10 by 10 meter quadrats in both old growth and second growth forest. And you can see a couple of things here. First of all, you can see that the old growth species accumulation curve is much steeper than the second growth forest species accumulation curve. So as you sample individuals, you get more new species in the old growth forest than in the second growth forest. Secondly, you can see that the curve for old growth forest stops much stops at about 180 individuals sampled, whereas the curve for second growth forest stops at about 500 individuals sampled. That's because the structure of the second growth and the old growth forest is different, and there are lots more small stems in the second growth forest, so you get lots more individuals sampled. But you can see just by looking at these curves that there's a big difference between the old growth and the second growth forest communities. And you can also look at these and you can think, well, in the second growth forest, that line the slope of that line is getting quite shallow towards the end so maybe we found most of the species in the second growth forest whereas in the old growth forest the line is still pretty steep when we stop sampling and so we might think that there's going to be a lot more species still to be found in the old growth forest so that's quite a nice example of how we can use species accumulation curves sometimes we don't have increasing effort as time goes on so in this example, we've put 21 camera traps out and we've recorded 18 species of mammal, but we put all the camera traps out at the same time and then we took them all back in at the same time and we, we recorded what was on them. But we can still use that to produce a species accumulation curve by sampling from our overall data set. So once again, we can plot number of species on the y-axis, but on the x-axis this time, we're plotting the number of traps. And we can ask the question, well, we had 21 camera traps, but how many species would we have seen if we only had one camera trap? If we just put one camera trap out, how many species would we have seen? 
And the maximum number of species we got on a single camera trap was five. So we might have seen five. Alternatively, we got four and three species on a couple of camera traps. And then we had quite a few camera traps with two, one or zero species on them. So we can sample from the data we have and we can say, well, we might have got five species, but it would be more likely that we got no species. And overall, we can work out a kind of average number of species that we would have seen if we only had a single camera trap. Then we can ask the question of, well, what would we have seen if we had two camera traps? If we had two camera traps, we can say we can randomly remove pairs of camera traps from our data set. And we can say if we had this pair of camera traps, how many species would we have seen? And there's actually 210 different combinations of pairs of camera traps from 21 camera traps. So the number of possible numbers of species that we would see would increase. We know that we had one camera trap with five species and one camera and two camera traps with four species. So the maximum number of species that we would have seen from a pair of camera traps would be nine. We had lots of camera traps with no species, so we would still have got quite a few zeros. And then we would have got a lot of combinations of these numbers in between. So if we sample from our camera traps and ask the question, what would we have seen if we had two camera traps, we're going to get a set of data something like this, and we're going to work out a kind of average number of species that we might have seen if we had two camera traps, and that average is going to be somewhere around here. And then we can continue doing this, so we can say, well, what would we have seen if we had three camera traps? And again, well, there's a lot of combinations of three camera traps from 21 camera traps, there's over a thousand. We may be not going to want to use all thousand, all we, we may be not going to want to use all of them, but we're certainly going to be able to sample a lot of them using a computer. And again, we can work out a kind of average number of species that we might have seen if we only had three camera traps rather than the 21 that we used. Now, if we go to the other end of our distribution of camera traps, we can say, well, how many species would we have seen if we had 21 camera traps? And the answer is, well, we would have seen 18. And we don't really have any way of sampling that further because we only had 21 camera traps. That's the maximum number we had. So there's there's our only data point for 21 camera traps. What about 20 camera traps? Well, instead of taking one camera trap from our data set and saying how many species would we have seen if we had this one camera trap, we can remove a single camera trap from our data set, leaving 20 camera traps, and say how many species would we have seen if we only had 20 camera traps. And quite a lot of the time we'd still have seen 18, but some of the time we'd have seen slightly fewer. So we can work out a mean or some kind of central tendency for those data, and it's gonna be around about there. And then hopefully you can see that for all the intervening numbers of camera traps, we can do exactly the same thing. We can draw at random from our data set of camera traps, we can draw a number of camera traps equal to the number that we're interested in, and we can say how many species would we have seen? And then we can do it again, and we can do it again, and we can do it again, and we can work out a set of average numbers of species that we would have seen for all of the numbers of camera traps that we might be interested in. And then we can put a line through that, and that line is our species accumulation curve. The other thing we can do with an analysis like this is we can put in some indication of how confident we are in each estimate of where the species accumulation curve should be. Because we've got all of these different samples, we can calculate a standard error for them, and then we can calculate a 95% confidence interval. And when we've got a big range of possible numbers of species, we're gonna have big confidence intervals. When we've got a small range of numbers of possible species, we're gonna have small confidence intervals. So not only can we work out what the species accumulation curve should be, but we can also put some kind of indication of confidence on our estimate of the species accumulation curve. So let's look at our actual data. And we don't have to do this sampling by hand. We can do it using a computer. And in this case, we're gonna do it using the vegan package in R, and we're gonna use the specacume function, which will do this for you. And will also draw you a nice species accumulation curve with those confidence intervals. So this is the species accumulation curve that we get from specacume if we use it on our camera trap data. And you can look at that and you can see that our species accumulation curve is tailing off quite nicely. It's not reached a flat slope at the top. It's not reached an asymptote at the top, but it's certainly flattening out quite nicely. And you could maybe extend that curve a bit and you could say, yeah, we're, we're pretty close to sampling 
all of the species in our community. If you wanted to, you could fit some kind of curve to those data and you could work out exactly where you would expect that asymptote to be. And you could say on this basis, we think that there are so many species in our community that we've got a really good sample of all the species in our community and we might think that we're going to need to do something else we're going to in have to increase our effort to get a really good idea of how many species there are in our ecological community so to summarize we can draw species accumulation curves whether or not we've got incremental increases in effort we can do it for a situation where we do have incremental increases where we say sampling bats every night over a long period or we can do it for a situation where we just have one big effort because we can break down that big effort into smaller efforts and we can sample from our data distribution and we can say what would our species accumulation look like if we did have incremental efforts. If we get a species accumulation curve that looks like the slope is approaching zero towards the end, then we're gonna be pretty happy that we've sampled all of the species in that community that we're able to sample. If we get a species accumulation curve that remains steep at our maximum effort, then we're gonna know that we haven't sampled all of the species in that community that we're able to sample. And finally, we can use species accumulation curves to compare between ecological communities, and they tell us things about the differences between those ecological communities.